have it in my hand. I could put my computer in there with you. He was trying to listen, but he thought this is wrong. Because he's still listening in here. But you need, he sent you the link to gain the Zoom. He did send me a link. Whatever you need, you need. Whatever you need, you need. But I am a long-time member, director at the church. I'm the bus driver sometimes. I'm the maintenance person. I'm the, I help out in the kitchen at the church, and we also That's have oral. food Saturday. Okay, we are live on Facebook. I'm also involved in that. I'm a Christian. I believe in God. I'm a preacher. I preach from the pulpit. Good. And I believe that us as preachers and ministers of God must set example. We must live a life different and apart from the world or where the world would see us. And, um, mm -hmm. Yeah, you don't need to hear the visit, you just have to stay with it. And you know, we are also in Africa about spreading the word of God and physically helping people with their personal needs. But we believe more than anything else is to spread the word of God to tell people that there is hope in this present generation and here. Thank you very much, uh, Brother Foy. We'll now hear from uh, Bishop Seaton. Good morning again. Thank you so much. I have My them. name is Charles Seaton, and I've been given several titles. I have them connected here. Yes, so right. District, several islands and countries involved, over four language barriers and different nationalities. We stretch from Dominica all the way down, including most of the Leeward Islands, going way down to the ABC Islands, Aruba and Curacao, and then we cross the Atlantic over into Europe, where we have churches in Holland. So those fall under my responsibility, but I'm also superintendent of the Methodist Church here in the St. Thomas, St. John Circuit, and immediate pastor, or the pastor of the Christ Church congregation as well. What about our church? As the name suggests, the Methodist Church in the Caribbean and the Americas, and particularly the Leeward Islands District, we do cover a wide range of territories and so the challenge always is to how to disseminate the gospel of Jesus Christ to all persons, irrespective of class, clan, nationality, or language. It means, therefore, that we're seeking always through the mission of Christ, making it our own, and seeking to transmit that message in word, deed, and sign to all peoples as far as that is possible. Here locally, the Methodist Church has been around for a long time. In fact, at Christ Church in December, we celebrated the 110th anniversary of the Christ Church Chapel. That itself speaks volumes. But we are visible, and we are currently involved in various aspects of the church community. And so we give God thanks for his presence with us and his work among us as well. Good. We want to thank you so very much. Thank you so very much, Bishop Seaton. Um, well, we're going to go with the next person. I think we're going to ask um, the Pastor John Gilbert. Could yes, you go good forward? You've been on with us before. Yes, I have. Yes, I have. Well, say good morning to everyone, and just a, a great privilege and honor to be back here and to be asked to be back here again. In this um, Holy Week, Resurrection Sunday, we know is Sunday. I'm Pastor John Gilbert. I pastor the Frederick State Baptist Church on the beautiful island of, of St. Croix, the big island of, of St. Croix. Also, I am the director uh, of Project Hope Outreach Ministry. And, uh, and also, we run a great internet radio station, uh, which is the Caribbean Christian um, Broadcasting. And so just a privilege and an honor to be here with you guys this morning. Uh, is this coming through clearly? 
shit. Yeah. Yes, yes. Okay, good, great. We want to thank you so very much. Okay, um, someone is saying that for a second it wasn't coming too clearly. Oh, okay, good. Uh, is it better now? Yeah, yes, yeah okay. Yeah. It was the last. Um, last okay. yeah, we were supposed to have someone from Tortola. Is that? Uh, um, he, he's, not, he's not with us. He, he, he wasn't feeling well. Apostle Foy. Yeah, he's not with us. So we have uh, Pastor Jefferson Niles. We have the Niles is with us. Let yes. me commend uh, my good friend, um, Jefferson Niles, because he was here with us from the inception. So he has been here for 15 years um, on this program. And we want to commend him and thank him for his dedication and commitment for um, sharing his experiences and, and with his ministry. So we'll go to him now. Good morning. Happy, happy Thursday and blessed Monday, Thursday, Holy Thursday to everyone. It's wonderful to be on again for this annual conversation for the last 15 years. That's a long time. Um, I believe that we've got to know each other quite well, those of us who've been regulars on the program, and I feel a, a bond, a connection with all the participants. I'm Jefferson Niles. I have um, served as a Methodist minister in St. Thomas, where Bishop Seaton now is, so he's my bishop. I greet him specially, as I greet everyone, and I also served on the big island where Pastor John is um, as superintendent of the St. Croix circuit. And in 2017, I sought permission from my conference to serve under another conference, uh, the United Methodist Church Conference. So I'm here now in the United States. I served five years at the Fulton First United Methodist Church and in July last year, I um, moved into a new appointment here at the Cicero United Methodist Church. So I've had about seven appointments in my ministry experience so far, and it has been a joy to be able to serve the Lord in these various capacities. And I've had many experiences over the years and I look forward to our conversation today for the, um, the discussion we will have. And as we continue in this Holy Week, I trust that everyone will be blessed, inspired, and uplifted. So God bless you. Nice to be here again. Uh, back, back to the studio. Is the studio hearing us? Wonderful. I, I can go. Okay. Yes, I'm. I'm hearing you now. Yes. Okay. Wonderful. Wonderful. This is Apostle Oral Hazel. It's good to be here again uh, with all my other fellow ministry leaders. It is truly a time that we look forward to, uh, a time of warmth. So we thank uh, Senator David for consistently uh, inviting us so we can talk uh, for our community and the, the world. So we are uh, on WSDA and we are streaming live um, via Facebook about um, Christ's death, resurrection. Okay, his death, 
and his burial and his resurrection. And this is an awesome story for us to consistently reach out and tell the story about uh, Jesus. Um, I, pa I pastor at Global Life Church here on the island of St. Thomas. We're located at 5 2 Estate Rapun. And I'm involved with uh, the CCM Caribbean movement. I'm involved with the um, Caribbean movement, um, the ICA movement out of Trinidad. Uh, I, I mean, a lot of stuff happening. I'm on the, the Kings and Priests board, where we, um, we actually going after men throughout the world, in every region of the world. And we have a conference coming up in um, this year. And I'm, I'm a part of um, consistent prayer for the world. I mean, we're kind of busy here. And every Monday we meet online and we pray for Europe, the Caribbean, Africa, Asia, Antarctica, wherever. And we pray. Uh, but this um, week we're having, um, we're inviting the community to come out at the Emancipation Garden. We're having on Friday, Good Friday, we're not going to be in the church, and a number of churches, about 12 of us come together. We are going to be it at the Emancipation Garden. We're going to be feeding the homeless. We have salt fish and rice and breadfruit, and maybe we have some more watering stuff we're going to give to the homeless. We're going to be there from 12 to 2 feeding the homeless. Then we invite the community to come on out Every from uh, 2. Yeah. To, to about 7 p.m. We're yeah, going to have great. prayer, yeah, praise, yeah, and them worship them. in St. Thomas in the capital. You know, so that's I me. So right now I send it back to you. Um, I send it back to you in the studio, back to you in the studio. We're hearing some little chatter. We're hearing some chatter. We're hearing some chatter in the studio. So be careful. Yeah. In the studio, we're hearing it. Um, in, in the studio, we're hearing chat. So back to you, um, Senator David. Thank you, If, if they're talking to me and not hearing yeah, yeah. them. I, yeah, I'll try to reach out to them. Uh, in the studio, we're not hearing you. Maybe you know us. In the studio, we're not hearing you. They're mute. He's muted, that's why. Robert Brown is muted. Unmute yourself in the studio. Oh, you didn't get a chance to present yourself. Okay, wonderful. I, I, I did, yeah, but we weren't hearing you. Because he was oh, okay. muted in the studio. So, all, all what, what happened is that you have to listen to talk in this in the control area. We are hearing too much talking there. And we are and we are streaming it, so we're hearing all this chatter every time. Yeah, okay. Did everyone um present? E everyone presented, yes. Okay, great. Now so I was saying what happened while all the Methodist Church prepares and everything for um, the crucifixion and, and the resurrection. And I was talking about what happened last night and what's happening tomorrow on Sunday and what have you. But I, I've got to ask this question. I've got to ask this question. Is the resurrection losing its sting, losing its teeth, based on what you're hearing on the news media around the world? Is the resurrection story losing its teeth? Are we going to... Who, who, who is going to go first? I, I, Let's I go think... to you, um, Hazel. Uh... John was going in. Pastor John was going. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, go yeah. ahead. I, 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 think, I think that that's a simple answer. To that The answer to that is no, the resurrection is not losing its momentum. It's, it, it is not, it's not, that's not at all. I, I, will, I will reverse that and say people is the one who is losing their momentum. But the, as far as to the resurrection... You know what I mean? Because the resurrection is a phenomenon story. It's, it's a, it, it is of a truth, and 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 so and so. If 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 the if if the resurrection loses its momentum, then guess what? Then guess what? Everything else about God 
should also lose its momentum and nothing about God will ever lose, lose its momentum. So it, it is people who's, who's giving up, it's people who's hope, who's losing hope, you know what I mean? And, that, and that's simply because they're not cleaving or hanging on to the hope that, is read, that, that has been set before us. There's a hope that's been set before us. And the hope that's been set before us is our very own resurrection that we should be looking forward to. So if we are looking forward to our very own resurrection, then guess, then guess what? The momentum should be high. <laughs> People should be excited, you know what I mean? To know that they have life and life everlasting within them, you know, and don't get me started on that. So let me, let me, let me, let me reverse back and <laughs> turn it to Pastor Hayes. Bishop, Bishop Seaton, do you want to contribute to that? <laughs> Thank you. Um, there is a sense in which persons are not as much drawn to Christ and to Christianity as perhaps in the past. In some parts of the world, and I, I hasten to stress, in some parts of the world, but, you know, the good news about that in other parts of the world, in, in Latin America, in Africa, the church, and I'm not specifying denomination here, but the church of Christ is growing leaps and bounds. But to answer the question specifically, the resurrection was and is about a particular event in one sense. But in another sense, and in reality, it is about being resurrected to new life, new opportunities, new chances because of God who manifests himself in Jesus Christ. So yes, there may be a falling away from persons who once were Christians or once held the Christian faith daily, but in a real sense, we see growth in the church elsewhere that is really phenomenal. And the real resurrection story is the one that is born in our hearts. When we are given second opportunities, maybe third, fourths, to live again, to thrive again because of Jesus. Thank you. Good, thank you. How about Minister Foy? Do you want to make a contribution here? Well, the question of the momentum of the resurrection, I think there are some loss because people are the ones who must carry the momentum forward to keep the story alive. And I think that as, as believers, we are not doing a good job. Uh, uh, individually, in some pockets, you may see it increase. But overall, as the body of Christ, I think we have allowed the world to dictate to us now because in, in many churches and religious groups, you find where people are conforming rather to Christ or to the resurrection story, as we put it, they are conforming to world and world standards and you know we have movements now that are totally anti-christ and we find people that are sympathizers from the churches different, different sex and um, religious groups who are sympathizers not keeping in mind that christ has already set the standard and we as believers must continue to preach the unalterated truth about christ of the resurrection about god and i think that's where the momentum is being lost because people are more given to Sinful men are more given to doing things worldly. It is easier, but it is harder for us. We have known for years. It's harder for us to just uh, say, you know, today I'm going to live for God. No, or or mm -hmm. anything of that sort. You look at no, no, Sundays, for instance, uh, uh, for those of us who mm -hmm. grew up worshiping on Sunday, mm -hmm. Sundays are churches are basically empty. Beaches and every other place is of public people. And sometimes, including that, people who are supposed to be. And so I believe that there is a momentum loss because the people themselves have fallen away from the truth. Good. Thank you so much. Um, could we hear from Reverend Niles? I'd, I'll be brief in terms of my response to that question. Based on what I have seen and, and what the inquiries that I have received about, well, just the, the services, the worship we have on the resurrection day, Sunday, and, and, and what we're doing this week. Well, where I am, generally, the, 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 the days that are observed are Thursday tonight, tomorrow, and then Sunday. And based on the inquiries, I would say that people still have a high regard for what goes on at this time. And we anticipate 
that there will be good attendances at the services that we will be holding, which is an indication to me that it has not lost its momentum. It has not, Easter has not, or the resurrection has not lost its power, that people still think about it. And um, those whom we refer to as the CEOs of the church usually turn up at this time. The Christmas, Easter only <laughs> person, we can expect to see them. So in that, in that sense, it has not lost its power and its momentum. Good, great. Before we go on to um, uh, Hazel, um, Pastor Hazel, um, could you once again, um, Hazel, announce how people could access this program now on WSDA? Yes, um, you can go up on Facebook and we are live streaming it. Uh, you can go on John Gilbert's page and see it. That's a John Gilbert. Or you could go on Oral Hazel page on Facebook and you can also see it there also. And you can, what you can do is just share it, share it, share it to your friends and let them know. I've, I've already tagged a lot of my friends on WhatsApp and all over. So they'll be able to see, see us and hear us. And I think, um, I'm not sure, uh, Pastor Gilbert, if you can see any questions they ask. You can see questions. If, and you can ask questions on Pastor Gilbert's page or my page. I'll take my cell phone and look, and then if you could answer them during the program, we can. Great. Now, then we're going to hear from you, and then Victor is going to be the next. Um, voice okay, wonderful. Uh, okay, oh, and, and that question, I believe that the resurrection is still awesome and powerful. The resurrection is pivotal uh, to our Christian journey. The death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. That's, that's the power source of Christianity. That's where we get salvation by our Savior, who, who shed his blood and he died for us on the cross. It is through Jesus that we are healed. It is through Jesus we are redeemed. So this Christian um, the, the basis of our Christianity is actually built on the foundation of Jesus. The Bible called Jesus the chief cornerstone, and he's also the chief apostle of the church. And so therefore, if there was no death, no burial, no resurrection, no shed blood, crown of thorns, no cross, then we would have no Christianity. The whole thing will just be a fallacy. It will be a story. But it's not a story because we are positive here as men of God that he lives and he dwells in our heart. If we ask him to come into our hearts, be our Lord and master, he will come in. He says, I am knocking at your door. Will you let me in? And do you experience the power of his resurrection? Back to you in the studio. Great. Uh, yeah, good morning, all. This is Victor Sydney, and indeed we're celebrating 50 years. I mean, 15 years that we've been doing this. Uh, I know we have some of some of you there that uh, were with us when we started out, and it's funny how time seems to roll on. Uh, what I would like a comment from from maybe not the whole panel, but maybe a, a few uh, to give us a, a short synopsis of. This Easter story. Tell us what is Easter, how it came about, and what it's all about. I think I'll I'll, I'll start with Reverend Niles. I will say um, briefly, Easter. The Easter story is really a story that um, has built up from what happened to Jesus. Jesus came. He um, lived, he ministered, and then he eventually um, left the world. He was crucified. Now, this week that we're in is the crucial week, um, which began on Sunday, Palm Sunday, when Jesus rode into Jerusalem. And in that, in his coming to Jerusalem on that occasion, there was something of a of a clash of powers, of, of um, ideals, etc., and And Jesus, um, there was a confrontation, let's call it that. And as the week um, wore on, the tensions heightened, the hostility grew. 
And eventually, um, Jesus was taken prisoner. Um, he had something of a trial, you know, some people call it, a, um, you know, they say it was not um, a very fair trial, but he had a trial. Um, but he was taken in by the Jewish authorities at first, um, those who were part of the um, domination system, if we might um, use that term. But one thing that Jews could not do was to crucify a person. They could not carry out the death sentence. So it was the, um, the Roman authorities under the, under the leadership of Pilate, who was the governor at the time, who actually sentenced Jesus to death, who handed him over to be crucified. Um, and so Jesus was put to death because of the position he took. And, you know, in some ways they saw him as a threat. Um, you know, he claimed to be the king of the Jews or so they were calling him. And that seemed like a very threatening position to be in uh, where the Romans were concerned. Um, and so he was crucified. Um, his disciples and some of other followers witnessed it. He was um, taken down from the cross on the day of crucifixion, placed in a tomb. And when his followers went early on the first day of the week to anoint his body, because as far as they were concerned, that was the end of it. You know, they didn't quite get some of the things that Jesus was saying. And of course, they found this, the, the tomb was empty. And then Jesus appeared to his disciples and other followers on several occasions after that. So that's my brief, um, um, you know, discussion or discourse on how the resurrection came into being. I'm sure others will add to that. I'm sure. Um, how about Pastor Gilbert? Well, there's not much I can really say after um, Dr. Niles just gave that wonderful synopsis of of um, of the Easter week or what, really what we call Holy, Holy Week, you, you know, I mean, one of the things I, I would like to reflect about that because of the whole story, we see in the process of that, that, you know, when Jesus was going from judgment hall to judgment hall, you know, the, the you know, the denial of Peter is one of the things that stands out in my mind, you know, one who was close to him, one whom Jesus has prophesied into that says, you know, upon this rock, I will, I will build my church, you know what I mean? And to see that the Peter who says, Lord, no, I will die with you. And, and, and Jesus's words coming through to him that guess what, before the cock crows three times, you're going to the, deny me. You know what I mean? That's one of the great events of this particular story to know, you know what I mean? The denial of, of Peter, of the Lord and personal savior, you know, for him, even to the point of, of cursing, swearing that guess what? I do not know this man. I never been with this man. That's one of the phenomenal things I think of the story to see that the savior who came to die for us was rejected by such a close friend, I, 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 you know, and, and, and then even after the resurrection, you know, went back and regained that relationship by showing Peter his, for, his forgiveness. And I, I think that's a big part of the story for me, you know what I mean? You, you know what I mean? The prophetic words of Jesus playing out throughout the prophecy that things that he would say to his disciples, you know what I mean? You know, I, I came into this world to, to die, in, you know, in, you know, I mean, my hour has not yet come. But then when it began to unfold, we began to see the truth of the story reading up to his death, his burial and his resurrection. Good. Anyone else wants to um, contribute? Yes, I, I'll jump in. Apostle Oral Hazel. All right, well. You know, in 1 Corinthians 15, 14 to 19, without the resurrection, the, our Christianity hinges on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And in 1 Corinthians 15, 14 to 19, Paul says, without it, our preaching is vain. So without the resurrection of Jesus Christ, our preaching is vain. Our going at the podium every Sunday, preaching is vain, is zero. And without the resurrection, our faith in Jesus Christ, our faith in God, faith that if we die, we too are going to experience the resurrection power of Jesus. Also, that is vain. 
without it, Paul and others says that they were Paul, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John who, who told us about this resurrection story. They will all be false witnesses. Without the resurrection, we will be all remain sinners. So the resurrection story is very vital to our Christian journey because it all surrounds the Son of God, Jesus Christ. Okay, back to you in the studio. Amen to that, Bishop. Thank you. Amen to that. I just wanted to add, though, that in a world in which we are scientifically driven, we want to see, we want to touch in order to believe, the resurrection story comes with a new twist. Because it does not depend on our ability to see God, to see what God can do. It depends mostly on our ability, our willingness to allow God to work within our lives. In other words, simply put, it depends on our faith. It is by faith that we can understand the resurrection. While there is proof that there was an empty tomb, while there is proof that Jesus was actually risen from the dead, and while there is proof that he ascended, the real proof today comes by our faith when we are born again into a living faith unto a new hope in Jesus Christ. And when we can come to believe that God is what he says he is, then it does make a difference. So, um, there's the Amen. point they want to contribute to. I think I understand the question of the Easter story. I think it's a, a celebration, a commemoration of all the agony, pain, the joy, Christ, as he was crucified for us to celebrate because he believes, celebrate because he believes there is hope, hope for us the year after. And uh, I think that's why we celebrate the Easter because Christ, uh, mm -hmm. who suffered, mm -hmm. is our hope mm -hmm. uh, for the life of the day. Good. Now, in my church at Wesley Methodist, I see a growing, uh, growing back of the congregation. Just about every Sunday when I go to church, the church is filled with people. And I'm not certain whether the other churches are having that same experience. Uh, whether it's dwindling in their church, or uh, it's growing in their church. So I'd like to hear the experiences of um, the, the, the pastors here. Well, I, I'll speak to that. I mean, before I, before I address that, um, for those of you over there in St. Thomas and the radio station, you're also um, streaming on gospelexposure.com. That's an internet radio station. So I'll ask that when you speak, you speak a little louder because there are times our meter is not is not reading, you know, so that way those who listen via that 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 radio station can can hear these wonderful um, answers. I I I will I will say this um um as to our as to our church. You know, and we know we just went to COVID and COVID was a big thing. And after, you know, maybe was able to reassemble, a lot of people did not did not come back um, to church. And it did, they had me at a great, a great, a great concern. And one Sunday I went to church and the church was full. And I said, what happened? That's all I could have said. <laughs> you know what I mean? What happened? Thank you, Jesus. You know what I mean? And from then until now, you know what I mean? We've been seeing not, not, members who did not come back but we are seeing new faces you know what i mean different different people as a matter of fact I, I i love the direction that i see the church going i you know I me mean? and for us it's really going in a multicultural directions so we have filipinos we we we, we have puerto ricans we have white we have black and and we have, and we have the mixture of the other of the whole caribbean in in there and so we we are seeing we are seeing that, and I and I thank God I thank God for 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 what it is that He's doing in that di that direction, you know. So for us every Sunday, yes, we are, we are seeing new faces, you know, in in church. And so I give God the praise for that. I'll I'll jump in here, Jefferson here, and I would say yes. Um, 
couple of years, well, three years ago now when this started and we were getting into the height of the pandemic, I think most of us were quite concerned about the impact it would have in the, on the church in the future. And I can say that, um, you know, in, in, the, in the place where I am at now, the Cicero United Methodist Church, we are seeing positive signs. I think we're moving in a good direction. People are returning to church. Some still have fears of COVID and um, prefer to view our live stream services or at least our recorded services. But we, we are seeing positive signs. And one very positive sign is that whereas we used to have the one uh, worship opportunity on a Sunday morning, which happened because of COVID, prior to COVID, there used to be two worships um, opportunities at the congregation. Um, but we were able to move back to having two services, um, two worship opportunities, 8.30 and 10.30 on Sunday mornings. And that, that is a very, very positive sign and while we know that there's still many people who have not returned, um, like Pastor John was saying, Pastor Gilbert, we have seen some new individuals come in and we are seeing a return to a church on the part of, of several persons. So I think we're moving in a positive direction. And what else? Yes, with yes, uh, Apostle, Apostle Hayes. Okay. Go ahead, Apostle. I yeah, Apostle Hayes, I concur with um, both pastors that the, the pandemic, um, we were in a low, but people are coming back. It's a struggle, but um, people yeah. are coming back and we are preaching. What, 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 how we, do, we are still doing our services in-house, um, in person. And if you want to stay in your car, you can come, park in the, in the church park, you're not staying in your car. And listen, and there are some people who are still doing that. And also, we are streaming our services until uh, most of the people feel comfortable uh, coming back. And we are, we are still doing uh, prayer meetings online. We are still doing um, Bible study online uh, because I, I find out that uh, people are connecting online okay, since the pandemic. But we do have in-person prayer time to our church. We are back to in-person prayer time, which is very vital to the church and also in person, um, worshiping together, in person, in the parking lot in your car, and also we stream online to YouTube, Facebook, LinkedIn, uh, everything that can shake a stick. We send the word of God out so you can, you can say, you cannot catch the word of God. So that's, that's you, our Pastor. story at we'll Global Life Church. Thank you, we'll take this call on the air, pass it on. Morning. I have a pastor with you, you understand? Well, good, ain't nothing wrong with we that. Have, everyone here is a pastor except for the two hosts. Okay, that's fine. Pastors, you know, where is the person? Knowledge came from that. It's Stacy, or Stacy. Could you repeat your question, please? Stacy, Ellen. Where in the scriptures, in the Bible, do you people remember where said knowledge oh, came from God, or good knowledge? I'm not a pastor, but I know it's written all over the scriptures that wisdom comes from God. I couldn't tell you specifically, but you could go up and book it and you'll find out exactly where to find it. But I'll tell you this is all over the Bible. And probably it is here for all the Ecclesiastic, I think. I just wouldn't know exactly. Oh, okay. You you know how to Google? I don't need to know how to Google. No. I can check out my Bible. Oh, okay, all right. Okay, I, I, can, I can help him. I can help with a scripture. I can help with a scripture. Oh, okay. All right. I, I, I can help him with a scripture. Oh, good. Okay, go ahead. I can help him with a scripture. Oh, oh, he's not listening. He gave somebody, somebody, wisdom or knowledge to impart to whoever where they close the pastor who maybe didn't even know. And I guess you wouldn't be able to find 
o parte, 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 o o parte, o parte, o parte, o Just like a long time ago, when they never listened to the prophet or the messengers, you know, the people, Ooh, because, yeah, they, nice. because of lack of knowledge, uh, yeah. the people shall go to something like that. And even when you have good intention and good knowledge, uh-huh. they are also going to set it aside. Yes, so I, I would. I, um, so to David, I'd like to jump in. Day. Um, Proverbs. Can, can, um, can you hear me at the studio? Proverbs um, 2 1 to 5. Oh, it says, boy, I, mean, I don't think you can hear you, Pastor. Oh. Okay. I, I was trying to come in with a, with a scripture to help the young man out. Oh, okay. In Proverbs ahead, yes. 2, in Proverbs 2 1 to 5 says, For the Lord gives wisdom, and from his mouth comes knowledge and understanding that's proverbs 2 1 to 5 for the lord gives wisdom so so that proverbs tells us that okay great we really appreciate that and i I like to add one more to that to um james chapter Mm -hmm. 1 and and verse number 5 will say if if you lack wisdom says ask god so just by asking god just tells us that, that that all wisdom come from God. The verse goes on to say, mm-hmm. uh, uh, who gives generously to all without finding fault, it will be given to him. So that clearly says to us that that that, yeah. that, that wisdom comes from, comes from God. Solomon asked for it and he got it in abundance. <laughs> he got it too uh, much. <laughs> uh, Minister, for you, what is the mm-hmm. question about church and the uh, I don't church we have free services. You can find it. It ain't gonna be that kind, but you can find it. Could, could, could the person speak up, please? That's speaking right now. What's it called? That was please, a cracker barrel. Be better. Yes, but then there's somebody else talking as well. Yeah. So, so we we're hearing another voice over yours. It's not on our. It's not on our end. Not on our end. Yeah. Yeah. It's too inside the studio. Tell in the studio be quiet. No, the studio. It's not the studio. The studio is quiet. Okay. Okay then. Okay, so I was saying that um, our membership is spread out across three services. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, that's a better mission in Baptist Church. We also have our programming on Facebook, and we also have the conference line that people call in. Uh, one of the things that I will indicate from my knowledge of learning is that the Bible clearly tells us to not to forsake ourselves the assembly. And I know that uh, many people find mm-hmm. it more convenient to themselves without any uh, any incapacitating them just to stay away from the, the, the congregation because they feel they don't need to be there to worship. In a sense, true, because we can worship God any place, but we must also be obedient to his, his command when there's nothing impeding us. We should be able to fellowship at the church because a presence at the church also sends signals to, to others who are concentrating, buying whatever you say, uh, who are not fully members mm-hmm. or Christian or testimonies or, or very, um, whatever we do. Yeah, you know, you're right there with you right the now. Bible, the days, they're looking at the lives of believers because they believe that uh, we set the standard and, and it should be that way. So we, we provide those three services. We provide online. We have our Bible study uh, and our prayer session also <laughs> our conference. Uh, what I did notice is, as one uh, person mentioned, is that while we
we have some members who probably have moved away and, and <laughs> off island or have not come, came back to our church since uh, COVID, we do see new faces that are coming. One of the things that we look at also is not so much the addition to the local church, but to the body of Christ. People who have made that profession of faith uh, because of something they have heard through the preaching of the gospel or oh, uh, I'm gonna just go. Uh, I'm ready to go right now. gravitating towards uh, Christ, and um, even though we don't see the, the full church or the full views, we know that people are being added to the church and people are listening to the gospel otherwise. Good. Victor? Oh, all right. Uh, staying with, with the Easter story, I know that, uh, I don't know if it's something that we do as tradition, but Easter time, we are very specific about the kind of foods that we eat. So I'm asking the panel, the diet that we use around this time at Easter, was it uh, uh, God told us not to eat certain foods, so we don't eat, <laughs> eat fish or chicken, but don't eat meat that has blood in it, don't eat beef. And, uh, as as that with my bishop, see <laughs> That's an interesting question. Um, something I've never really seriously reflected on, but I know that I grew up in a tradition where during Lent, as a part of fasting, one abstained from meats, meats full stop. You one may have fish, yes, but meats generally pork and all those other things you did not eat during Lent. You did not eat a lot of regular foods during Lent. In fact, the whole matter of praying and fasting was emphasized and still is to a large extent. So that one's um, diet was largely related not so much to, tra to tradition, but rather to the whole aspect of fasting. After that fasting ended, then Easter was the time of celebration when people literally ate what they wanted. Yeah, that would be my take on it. Anyone else wants to uh, contribute? I guess not. Like, yeah, Jeff, yes, yeah. Like, like Bishop Seaton said, um, I grew up with those practices as well. Uh, especially on Good Friday. In fact, Good Friday uh, in, in, this, in this setting where I'm, where I'm at now is, is very different. The culture here is very different from in the Caribbean and the culture in which I grew up. I think most of us would agree that Good Friday is perhaps one of the most sacred days for Christians. Um, here, it's a regular work day. Um, there's no real difference. But I remember back uh, when I was very young, and, and, and it's something that I've carried with me throughout my life, we keep Good Friday as a very quiet, solemn day. And yes, we avoid certain foods. In fact, the, um, the, the, the thing that we would eat on Good Friday would be you know, some kind of salt fish, perhaps, and um, some provisions. But it's it's always that very solemn. But I, I can't say that there's anything in scripture that would advise us or that would guide us in terms of what special diet we should have during Holy Week or, or during Lent. Um, but yes, related to the idea of fasting, prayer, fasting, um, you know, giving alms, you know, um, you know, responding to charitable needs, um, I would say that's where the, the idea of observing a certain kind of diet comes into play. And then after that kind of, um, you know, sort of depriving yourself, making a sacrifice during Lent, Holy Week, then we sort of celebrate again on, um, for Easter, because I would recall how my, I can recall how my um, grandfather and others would um, slaughter animals, you know, a, um, a cow, a 
or a pig or something that we would have Easter and beyond. Um, that's that's what I remember. It's more it's more um, family traditions than a biblical thing where Easter is concerned. I'm happy that you you say yeah. this. Uh, we're talking about this. I know growing up in Nevis, it was strictly no meat at all. Better be selfish than what we call kanki. We call it mm -hmm. yes. yes, so it's the right. same thing. You know? But interestingly, um, I, I was talking to a friend of mine this morning before he came to the studio, Carlson Dow. And we were saying now uh, on the mainland, Good Friday is a, a regular work day. Mm -hmm. And we agreed that we hope in the Caribbean this culture does not get changed at all. It's a sacred day, and we want to keep. I don't think anything could change me from that. But right. uh, someone sent me a text here, an uh, ardent listener to the program, and said, thank you for this program. We need lots of God's word. He said, but you have a lot of men pastors on. Where is Pastor Mal Malone? I have to say, I take the heat for that one. I fell down it. We've had um, Reverend Malone in the past. We've had several other female uh, pastors on here. Winnell, Curtin, Roberts. I take the heat on this one. I fell down mm -hmm. on it. So I apologize. It won't happen next year. Yeah. Okay? Uh, but I, I, I want to go to this still hovering over the question of the resurrection. Jesus preached to his disciples over and over again what was going to happen to him he preached toward galilee wherever he went what it was going to be happening to him that he would be turned over to the sinners and that he would be crucified and on the third day it is after three days say, on the third day i'll rise up i'll rise up but two ladies as, as it was a custom in that day in those days that ladies would go to the tomb with um, spices, spices to anoint the body. And when they got there, they noticed the stone was rolled away, that Jesus wasn't there and what have you. And they couldn't understand it. They were confused until two angels spoke to them. And then came Peter and John. They ran, they got there. And after all that they have seen, they saw, yet Peter had questions. Peter still had questions and concerns. Why would this be if these were Jesus' disciples that he preached to? You knew what was going to be happening to me. And even when he was walking along with his disciples, they didn't understand it. What, what, what may have happened here? Did they lose their faith? Did they, did they not believe what Jesus was telling them? What, what, what do you think um, happened? I, um, Apostle Oral, I believe what happened here is that they were looking for a king. Okay, remember when Peter took the uh, sword and cut, cut off the yes. servant's ear. Yes. And so they wanted a king to come. And they were always saying he is the king of the Jews. The Gentiles had their Roman king. So they, and they oppressed the Jews. So the Jews wanted a king to come up against uh, the Roman emperor of that time. And so they were always saying he is king. And they, they, they didn't believe so much in the Jesus thing, but they wanted to a king because they wanted their freedom and liberation from slavery of their day. So that's my little piece. Good, good. Anyone else wants to contribute? Part of it, I think, has to do with denial. Maybe not so much unbelief, but denial. If you put it in practical terms, think of... Think of any one of us who has somebody who is close to us, someone with whom we have a very special relationship, and the person keeps saying, I'm going away soon, you know, you're not going to see me. You don't want to believe that. I mean, a death is a typical example. Someone close to us dies, and it's so hard to accept that. We have seen the person die, we have gone to the funeral, we have ensured that there was a burial, but denial is a real part of of our lives when we find it difficult to accept the truth. That is one way of looking at it. And secondly, sometimes the truth does not always sink in until after the fact. 
and that, that, that's another way to look at it as well. That would be my contribution. Uh, when, anyone else wants to yeah. contribute? Yes, when, when, when Jesus said to his disciples, who do men say that I am? Um, Peter gave the right answer after, after they were saying, some say you are Elijah, some say you're John the Baptist, return. Peter declared, you are the, no, no. Um, he, he then asked them, then who do you say that I am? You know, after asking who were people saying he was, then he said, and then you, what about you? Who do you say that I am? And then Peter gave that famous declaration, you are the Messiah, the Christ, the son of the living God. And then Jesus, you know, sort of told Peter to keep this quiet. And then he began to speak about his death. In fact, in the gospel according to St. Mark, on three occasions, Jesus predicted, he told them that he was going up to Jerusalem and he was going to um, suffer and die, etc. But back to that time when Peter declared him to be the Messiah, and when Jesus said he's going to die, Peter said no, you know, Peter began to rebuke him. Uh, maybe that's part of the denial there, not wanting to accept that something like that would happen to his teacher, his master, his Lord. And Jesus said to him, you know, you are, you know, get behind me. In fact, he rebuked Peter. He said, you're like a stumbling block in my way. But Jesus tried to help them to understand that this was going to be his reality. This is what he was going to face. But for some reason, they didn't get it. Um, but it seemed to have made more sense to them once Jesus was crucified, once he was raised and he returned, it was, it was in retrospect that it made a lot of sense to them. And I, I, I would end by saying the same might be true for us. Um, Good Friday, Easter, this whole week uh, makes a lot more sense to us now because we know how it ended. But for those who did not know how it would end, how things would turn out, I can see how they might have struggled with accepting what Jesus was saying to them. Good. Anyone else wants to contribute? Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm going to say that, that um, based on what um, Pastor Hazel said, you know, I, 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 I think they was looking for a physical king to come and to actually liberate them from the enslavement or the bondage that there was in under the Roman um, Empire. And even though Jesus was speaking to them and, and pointing to them that, that, guess what, that's not why he came, they, they kept on missing it. They kept on missing it. I, I believe the spiritual understanding was not yet uh, uh, developed or perhaps open um, to them. Because if you think back, Jesus was saying things to them that, guess what, is given to you to understand the mysteries of the kingdom. And so I think they were so focused on the physical liberation that there was not consecrate, there was not there was not actually concentrating on the on the spiritual freedom that Christ was given to them. If we fast way forward to Acts, and when we're standing in the book of Acts, listen to what they ask him. Is it now are you going to restore to us the kingdom? <laughs> The earthly kingdom still was looking for liberation. Jesus had died. Jesus, Jesus was buried. Jesus had, was was uh, was 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 actually resurrected. Jesus was was standing before them on a mountain, preparing to go up to heaven. And they still asked the question: Are you going to restore us the kingdom now? Are you going to give us back what it is the Romans have taken away from us? They did not get the concept or the understanding until the infilling of the Holy Spirit. So I think there was only hearing with the physical ears and there was not hearing Jesus with the spiritual ears. And a lot of us are in church like that. A lot of us are in the kingdom of God like that. We hear from the physical ears, but we don't hear from the spiritual ears. And so we miss the principles of the Bibles when it comes to living our lives. Good, thank you so much. Minister, um, Paul, you wanted to come to this. Yeah, I was, I was saying that. I, I question of Peter still doubting after uh, Jesus had already told him that he was going to be crucified and that he was crucified uh, dead and was buried and there was still a denial. Now, in, in teaching, some people grasp it, some people grasp it very 
class, some people don't grab it at all, or some people, after somebody has commented it, I would say, yeah, that's what people are talking about. So I can, from my own personal experience, my mother died in a car accident when I was 17 years old, if I was older. And I just refused to believe that my mom was dead. And it took me almost 30 something years to really come to the grips that you know, your mother is dead and start to accept it. And after that, you know, a lot of the things that was plaguing me, for instance, like eating when other people cooked, what was not my mother cooking, all of those things just went away once I was able to accept the fact. But at that instant, when I went to the scene of the accident, after a painful burial and everything, I still could not just accept the fact that my mother, who I knew, was there. Okay, and I could understand that. No, because it was in your uh, well, uh, the time is moving on, so we, uh, you know, I want to ask this question, and I hope I'm not being, well, I want to be theologically correct and political correct at the same time. Um, it's a bit controversial, but I want to get the opinion of these men of cloth as it is. I want to get the pastors. I want to hear what they have to say about it. And what would God say? God made everything and everything he made, he said, that is good. What he made, he said, that's good. So what would God say about transgender? What would he say about transgender? I would like to start with uh, Pastor Oral Hazel. Indeed, it's controversial. <laughs> <laughs> Pastor Hazel, yeah. you're muted. Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm there, I'm there. Good. Uh, the Word of God talks about uh, people who become inventors of evil things. Uh, if, if you know in the Bible, everything is not listed in the Bible. Smoking, uh, you might talk about wine, being a wine bibber. But when it comes to certain things, the, there's a caveat in the word of God, which says that at, at the end of time, men will become... Are closer to your mic? Are they closer yes. to your mic? Okay, good. Men will become inventors of evil things. So that's where we are right now. People are inventing uh, evil things. In, um, when it comes to humankind, when it comes to medication... That will make you high as a sky, lose your mind, and and uh, people will do things with their bodies, with um in their sexual orientation. Uh, people will not be satisfied in the creature that God made them, in the skin that God made them, and so God said you you have gone to a particular area where we become an inventor of evil things for yourself inventor of evil things for other people inventors of evil things for a community they become inventors of evil things for a nation and so that, that's that's in god's word okay so that's my little piece okay reverend Niles. it's interesting host victor that you should um Ask that question. I am here with the United Methodist Church, and we are really in the throes of a serious um, conflict, um, a serious debate that's going on in the church right now concerning the, the question of LGBTQ plus, you know, the other letters that some people sometimes use. And I find myself at times having to minister to such individuals because they're in the church, you know, they're not just out there in the community, but they act, um, some of them actually attend church. Right. Um, I, I was pastor in my previous congregation of individuals who were married in same gender relationships. So it's it's very real for me that issue of um, LGBTQ 
plus. And so the, the debate that the church is facing uh, is, is whether there should be some, what, what they're calling gender equality if persons of that community, the LGBTQ community, can become ordained pastors, you know, they are, so they're openly gay or they're transgendered or whatever um, their sexual orientation might be, should they be pastors, you know, ministers in the church, can they be ordained? And should um, those of us who are ordained pastors or elders, as they refer to us, um, be, be allowed, you know, granted permission to officiate at such weddings and, you know, how should we be dealing with those individuals? So in, in 2024, next year, the General Conference of the United Methodist Church is going to be taking a vote on that very issue of gender equality in the church. And it is a very controversial, very sensitive, very difficult subject. We know what God's word has to say, you know, we can interpret the word and apply it to the issue. And we also know that these individuals are, are, are people who, whom God loves. I mean, no matter what people might do to themselves, I think God well, still yeah, loves yeah. them. And, and that we have to love them and, and, and respect them and, and, and minister to them as best as we can. So what, what sometimes happens is that there's a lot of anger that is generated over this subject. And there's a lot of hurt, a lot of pain, and, and just navigating this subject is a difficult one. Um, I kind of, um, you know, don't know how to really answer the question because, you know, one can come down and say, well, this is what the Bible says and people should not do these things to themselves. And then sometimes when you relate to these individuals, they tell you, well, it's, it's as natural to them as it might be natural for us to be who we are. Um, so it's, it's a difficult subject. As to me, it's not just a spiritual um, issue, but it's psychological and, and even maybe political as well, because we know how, how the politics plays into this matter um, that we're discussing. So I'm just letting you know that at, at the moment, I am in a, in a, a context where it is a very, very real issue for me as a pastor. And, and I am studying it. I'm trying to understand it um, even more than I have in the past. Good. Anyone else want to? Yes. Um, I'd like to jump back in. I, um, I just want to give a context. I, I, um, I am, uh, Victor didn't uh, give me a chance to get a scripture. So I want to give a scripture context. So in Romans chapter 1, 29 says, they have become filled with every kind of wickedness. This is the time in which we are living. Evil, greed, and depravity. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice. They are gossipers, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, boastful. They invent new forms of evil. They, 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 in, they, in, they, invent new forms of evil that disobey the appearance. That's Romans chapter 1. And if you want to see what's happening in the world today, all we have to go is to Romans chapter 1. What happened is that, yes, like God, like Jesus, we love the sinners, but we hate the sin. We do not hate people. And the, 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 the arbiter here is that God will be the final judge of the church, of the pastor, me, Oral Hazel, and, and any congregation. And so therefore we have to, if these are the last days. They're going to kill us. We're going to be ready. They're going to kill pastors before speaking the truth. So you got to be really sure that you are saved and you will be able to believe in this resurrection story. This is what is coming down to. We have seen it there recently in, I think, uh, Saudi Arabia, where they marched some guys down to the, and killed them because of their faith. They, they showed it on, on um, the street. And this is what is coming to, I mean, 
So we, we, I think that as men of God, we got to stand for something. And I know that God, we believe in signs, wonders, and miracles. And I believe that God, we should not tremble because God is going to take care of us. Sometimes we think about our salary. Sometimes we think about people. But the caveat here is to love the homosexual, the trans, the homosexual. We don't hate them. But therefore, we hate the sin. Romans chapter 1 tells us about sin. And everybody, those who sin, they're coming up against God's laws. God made you male. God made you female. And therefore, you want to change and switch to something else. Talk to God about it. And I believe there's help in prayer. There's help in counseling. And we just shouldn't just take it just like that. There is help in All God right. and there's help in his word. We want to get everybody's views on it. So we'll go to Pastor Ford. Yes, I, I was saying that one of the things that over the years as I read the Bible and as I listen to other preachers, one of the things that we have to focus on that anytime we have a question that is related to God's creation or the kingdom of God, we must go back to the Bible because the answers are in the Bible. We, we cannot neither legislate nor compromise God's business. God's instructions to us are clear. I, I think that any pastor, any preacher would know for sure that God's instruction is clear. Uh, to suggest that a transgender or person who lives a life other than God has created is simply saying that God has made a mistake somewhere in his history and we know that it's God did not, some people say, God made me this way. If God made you a male, you're a male. If God made you a female, you're a female. In, in my perspective, I'm understanding of the Bible. What happens is that when we compromise, when we start compromising and allowing inroads into uh, areas of taking apart things and doing, taking authority and things where God has not given us that, we make the mistake of simply opening up the doors to anything. And that compromises, people are compromising, you know, because I think Pastor Hill mentioned some people are afraid to lose their salary or their standing and things like that. But the danger of it is that what we are facing now, and as he also says, God has the final say and the final judgment. How God is going to judge us for the things we have done, contrary to those things that he said that we must do. And I think that's what we must do. But none of us want to make the sacrifice. We don't want to sacrifice our jobs, we don't want to sacrifice our standards, we don't want to sacrifice that. So we compromise and we go along with the world, we go along with Christ, and there is a price of problem. Okay, we'll, we'll go to uh, Pastor Gilbert, and then we'll finish off with, with Bishop Seaton. Pastor Gilbert? Well, yeah, yes, um, I want to say this. I, I, I heard um, Pastor Niles struggle um, in, the, in that because, like you say, it's a real thing for him. Um, um, right now, that's going on in the in the Methodist in the Methodist Church. Uh, one of the things we have to keep in mind as as pastors in this time that we're living in with this with this big um, transgender thing that's going on, because that seems to be the big thing now, more than the homosexual things, you know, and it's big in in the lives of young people, especially more so than 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 ever than ever. Is that is that in the minds of 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 sinners? You know what I mean? And I love what it is I heard um, Pastor Nas said. In, in, the, in, in the minds of sinners, it's a nat it's natural to them. It is natural to them in their minds. And I, I and I think that is the struggle, okay, <laughs> that we have with the church because we have to view them as as guess what? You're you're a sinner and 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 and, and, and as somebody who don't have Christ in your life, yes. sinning is natural to uh, to them. Just think about us, okay? Just think that about us, okay? Before we came to Christ, how sin was natural to us. We thought it was a day, a part of everyday life. Yeah. Today, as Christians, when we sin, we feel convicted of the sin that okay. we commit, and we go to God and ask us to forgive, to forgive us of sins. What we have to learn to do is to love the person in their natural state of sinning and try to bring them to the light, which is the truth of God's word. Yeah, Only the truth. Only the truth is able to change, is to change the thinking of a man, is to change the mind of, 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 of the person, as the Bible tells us, to be transformed by the renewing of our, of our, of our mind. 
And I think that is a, that is that, that is our, our struggle. We are not to compromise the gospel, but we ought to sit and talk to them from a loving, caring place, you know, and 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 understand that they're sinners and sinning is natural to them. And so so therefore they don't know any other way. Only unless they come to the truth, then they will know another way. And our responsibility is to bring them to the truth and, and allow the Holy Spirit of God to begin to put the conviction in their heart as he has to put the conviction in our heart for us to stop sinning as well. That's that's my take on that. Okay, we're going to take this call and then anyone else who wants to contribute. You're on the air, please. Yes. Good morning. Good morning. To uh, the entire panel and utmost respect to all the pastors. And um, a special, special shout out to Reverend Niles, my dear pastor. Uh, Reverend Niles, I so appreciate your response. And the last pastor that was speaking, yes, we all read the scriptures and... Um, have reverence and humble ourselves before the Lord and try not to, uh, you know, uh, go against the scriptures, question the scriptures and cause confusion. But at the same time, it is still written that the Lord, our God, Father and Savior, loves the individual, the human, but hates the sin. Um, and it is stamped that um, a homosexuality or gay or um, the LGBT plus, you know, whatever the labeling that you want to give people, they are still human beings. Yeah, but. And um, struggling and the, the situation, especially the children, not really understanding their sexuality as yet, because they're still children. And the confusion, controversy, political issues and whatnot, still humans struggling with whatever situation. And you have uh, people committing suicide and whatnot. And the, the insensitivity is very hurtful. When people are, you know, they are so uh, steadfast and so biased, hateful, resentful, you know, and the cause these suffering for fellow human beings that people have to take their life. You know? So there is a lot of controversy, but there is different things that we must take into consideration. Father God love everyone, no matter what. You know? And um, we must be humble because you know, even though we consider ourselves normal, straight, um, heterosexual or whatever, we are sinners, you know, and come short of the glory of God. So I, I plead for our our clergy, you know, you all are so respected, highly regarded, but still, you are human beings. You have family, you know, and we all have shortcomings. We must still think of the human condition and be sympathetic and understanding and loving and not be so, you no, know, no, uh, so firm in our judgment, you know, because you, suppose you yourself as a pastor, 
have a, a family member who mm. is a member of the gay community. Mm. You know, you might want to shun and hide and whatnot. How do you deal with that? You as a pastor, you know, highly religious and whatnot. How would you deal with that? We're running out of time. You go down, hang up and listen. We want to thank you for your contribution. And give thanks and to the Lord. Okay, thank you. Be sympathetic right. and understanding. Okay, good. Thank you. And so, God bless you all. All right, happy Easter. Hi, Pastor Niles. Right. Love you. Thank you. I don't know. I want to pick up where our sister left off from the perspective that we're not dealing with a simple issue at all. We're dealing with a, an, an, an issue that is extremely complex, extremely divisive, and extremely controversial. It is one thing to take a spiritual look at it. In other words, looking at it from a spiritual point of view and taking a stand. But I think that when we consider that there are several other factors involved, biological, psychological, spiritual, socialization, and ethical values all involved, it makes the decisions a lot, it makes the situation rather a lot more difficult. I am not at all defending the LBGTQ plus group, nor am I launching an attack against them. I think what it boils down to is that as pastors, we have to be a lot more understanding of what people are experiencing in their own lives. I am not sure in my own mind that all of what happens in that particular topic we're dealing with is simply as a result of what we label sin. I am convinced though of what the Bible teaches and I'm also convinced of my own position and the position of the Methodist Church in the Caribbean and the Americas on the issue. So what my brother, Pastor Niles, is dealing with in the UMC, we are not dealing with that in the MCC, that is the Methodist Church in the Caribbean and the Americas. But that's another issue for another time. I simply want to urge that... We don't throw the Bible at people, but we exercise the love of Jesus in seeking to understand where they're com coming from. But at the same time, I strongly condemn socializing children, young children, boys and girls, teenagers, to bend one way or another. And that is a deliberate attempt by many of those persons who are so inclined. I know that for a fact. I think what is important is that if we have persons within our churches, persons within our own families, and I do know some pastors who are homosexuals, or gay persons, yeah, and while we may not necessarily agree with their lifestyle, we are called upon to love them and to show them the love of Jesus Christ. I will not personally go as far as to marry um, persons of the same gender, and I cannot be forced by the law to do that, since the constitution of the church of which I am a part gives me the freedom to do or not to do. What I would urge, though, is not the condemnatory approach, but an approach of understanding, approach of being sympathetic, and an approach that would, in the end, help persons to come to a better understanding of who they are, being made in the image and likeness of God, and being able to cope with the many pressures that they feel. That would be my take on it. Well, let's take this call. You're on the air. Pass it on. Make it brief, please. Oh, yes. I'm going to be very brief with mine because I'm not, I'm, I'm not a religious person okay. by any stretch of the imagination. Uh -huh. However, I'm just going to look at it from a practical viewpoint. And the, the one that just spoke, I do agree with him. I do not subscribe to the lifestyle. However, you cannot be judgmental of people. They are people. But just like how that is a sin, there are other sins that we have to focus on also, such as adultery. There are multiple sins that fall under an umbrella just like this sin that you are discussing. So 
when we look at sin, you know, in a nutshell, there's plenty of sin that we cherry pick and we decide, well, we're not going to choose that sin, but that sin. It doesn't work that way. Okay? So, if, and I know it's in the Bible. Adultery, rape, murder, you name it. They're all sin. The problem is that some people in the church select which sin they want to focus on. When it comes down to sin is sin. No matter how you turn it. And just like how we are preoccupied with this, we should be preoccupied with all the other sins too. And I'm sinning. Oh, thank you much. Bye -bye. Thank you for your contribution. Uh, uh, you know, I think this conflict in the end days is going to get hotter and hotter because it recent, recently the Church of England embraced same-sex marriage. And I just re read very recently where the Pope is banning same-sex marriage. So you see the, uh, the difference there. So it's going to be uh, well, something, it's something that... that, that exported throughout the globe. Yes, globally. yes, absolutely. Um, yeah. Administration wants to subjugate the people to their, their laws. If they are going to give them some money, they yes. have to go along with our program. Yeah. You know? yeah. and, and same thing in the Caribbean yeah. islands. Those independent islands still, yeah. Montserrat, if Britain sends some money, you have to go along with their Tied program. Yeah, with their program, else, yes. You know, doesn't work. Yeah, we, we, even if we get federal money, exactly. tell us how these are going to be spent. Exactly. That's nature. But I want to go back because time is running out here on us on to the, the resurrection. Yeah. We could remember reading in the Bible that when Jesus revealed himself to his disciples and he called them fools, I think that's in Luke 24, somewhere around there, and he, he was hostile because he said, I taught you all these things before. I told you what was going to happen to me. Sinners were going to take me over. The, the authorities, they were going to arrest me. I was going to be crucified. And the third day, I would raise up from the dead again. And, and you here, you're, you're, you're fighting with this. And How foolish are you? Don't you think Jesus was a little hard on them? Uh, Bishop, what do you think? You don't think it was hard? You think, you think that... Yeah. No, I don't think so. I think I think you're referring to the conversation that occurred between Jesus and the two persons on the road to Emmaus. Yes, absolutely. Yes. Because they went, they were coming back from Jerusalem, mm -hmm. quite dejected, because the Jesus whom they loved, whom they were devoted to and sought to believe in, was no more. Mm -hmm. Jesus, unrecognized by them, came up. And had this conversation. Why are you so depressed? And they related all that happened. But he said, but it was laid down in scripture. That's right. And did I not tell you that? Why is it that you're so hard to believe? So he had reason to be um, upset. So. Yeah, but I don't know he was that harsh. <laughs> I think he was leading them to a point. He called them, for, he called them fools. <laughs> he was leading them to a point of <laughs> recognition. Yeah, okay. Because he recognized, and I'm going to be quiet just now, that when he sat down, he broke bread with them. Yes. Their eyes were open. Their eyes and were open. They said, uh -huh. Their eyes were open. Yes. You're absolutely and they recognized correct. Yes, yes. So sometimes all of us need an eye opener. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> okay, we're getting close. We're just I'm, about there. So I'm also. Yes. Yeah, I'm also thinking when, when you were saying that, I was thinking about two other disciples, James and John, uh -huh. who came to Jesus with a request. And in one of the Gospels, it was their mother that came with a request that they be allowed to sit one on his right and one on his left when he set up his kingdom. Like someone was saying earlier, they were thinking more than earthly kingdom. And then the other disciples were a bit upset with them because of the request they made. And then Jesus took the opportunity, used it as a teachable moment to show them that the Gentiles lorded over those, that, um, you know, when they're in authority. But in his kingdom, it's not like that. His kingdom is a kingdom of service. So leadership in the kingdom of, of, of God, the kingdom that Jesus came to make known, is, is, is one in which we serve. And there's where we find Jesus's famous words for the son of man came not to serve, I mean, not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. So I don't know if, if, if that is something too, because he, he, you know, he spoke hard to them on that occasion as well. He asked them if they, they were able to drink the cup of suffering that he was gonna be drinking. And, um, you know, he taught them what it means 
to be in a position of privilege and power in his kingdom. It's all about service and not something for themselves. Good. At this point in time, what we're going to do, we're going to ask each of you to close out with a minute. And, and Reverend Niles, we ask actually to close the program with a prayer, brief prayer, after everyone has given um, his brief contribution along this line, concluding the program. Well, the least of the brethren, I just want to say thanks to you, Mr. David, and thank you for allowing me to be a part of this session. And of course, my pastor, who seeing fit to ask me to sit in for him, it's quite a learning experience, and it's, it's good to be able to hear the views of other people. Absolutely, and I want you to know he was one of the original pastors. He and Reverend Niles were the first two. Yes, yes. And as well, that's Pastor Ben, we're always pioneering something. Yes. And, you know, but I'm, I'm just happy. And, you know, um, one of the things that I, I want to believe, you know, I don't know how people will do it. I believe the Bible as it is, the Word of God, you know, and God's Word, we must be willing to preach and teach God's Word as we understand it from God's mouth, the Scripture. And when we, and again, anytime, we don't have to hate people, but anytime we start making compromises, going to end up going for saying something that we shouldn't say and, and have ourselves to, to be on. Um, thank you. Bishop Sitton. No. Thank you very much. Again, I join my brother in saying thanks for this opportunity to share, not only here in studio, but via this, this radio station. I just want to remind us that in spite of maybe that particularly controversial matter, which does not seek to divide us, but to cause us to be more understanding of people what they're going through, and how we can rightfully divide the word so that those persons are helped in the process. I also want to appeal to persons to make sure that this season of Holy Week and Easter means something to them. Outside of just a discussion, take time because your faith is your personal responsibility. Pastors and others may help you with it, but it is your personal responsibility, and therefore it is an opportunity for us to believe and to live in the way that God has created us to do. Amen. 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 Pastor Gilbert? Yes, again, I want to say thank you guys so much for the opportunity to be here. Um, again, um, this, this year, I, I'm truly blessed. Um, and I, I, just want, I, I just want to say as we, as we go um, into this um, season uh, coming up on Sunday, you know, let's, re let's just remember that the resurrection has not lost any momentum and let's preach it with, 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 with passion and with love and, and with, with grace and let people know that Christ is risen and since he's risen, we too are looking forward to the resurrection of our mortal body because this mortal has to put on immortality and this corruption has to put on incorruption. So let's just preach it with the fact that one day we're looking forward for the change that, is, that, that has been promised to us. Again, thank you so thank much you for so having me. Thank you so very much, um, Hazel. Um, we Wonderful. want to thank you for your expertise. Thank, thank, you. thank you and your word. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you again for inviting us. It was really a robust conversation. And let us know that we love God's people. God loves you. He cares for you. We're inviting out our friends um, on Good Friday, we're going to be feeding the homeless. We're going to have Fourth Dimension. We're going to have also via ASAF, Minister Sheldon. We're going to have Minister Petra. Uh, we're going to have um, DJ Jedi and many more. They are in Emancipation Garden beginning at 12 noon, Good Friday. We're going to go from 12 noon to 7 p.m. The program for the community begins around 3 p.m. We're going to have time of prayer and worship and praise in our land. God bless you. If you'd like to come and visit with us at Global Life Church, we're going to be there at 10 a.m. at Global Life Church this resurrection uh, uh, Sunday. God bless you. Bless we it. love you Reverend and we are praying for some comments. Peace and then the prayer. Yeah, so I'm going to lead, lead me to Calvary. <laughs>
Let us pray. Oh, loving God, we are grateful for the time that we were able to spend together and for all the sharing that took place during this program. We thank you for the radio station and its management. We give you thanks for our hosts, Victor Sidney and Senator Roosevelt David. Thank you, Lord, for the members of the panel and all that we were able to share for those who called in and contributed. Thank you for those who have been listening and for the support that we have received over the years. And now as we conclude our program for this year, we ask, oh gracious God, that you will bless us today as we contemplate the suffering and the sacrifice that Jesus Christ experienced for us, for the world. We come to you asking for your inspiration and help. Today, Lord, we pray for all people who carry a heavy cross like Christ due to lack of shelter, poverty, sadness, and illness, or whatever other circumstances they might be facing. We also pray for all those believers who need your support. Thank you, Lord, for this day, for this season, for this time. Bless us and fill us with joy and triumph. In the powerful name of your son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. 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 Thank Amen. you so Amen. much. All of Amen. you contributed so significantly. But I just really wanted to remind the people that tomorrow, Good Friday, Wesley Church will be having service at 7.30 in the morning. And, and, um, and, and, and at 9 o'clock in Christ Church. 7.30 at Wesley in the morning, 9 o'clock at Christ Church on Sunday. 7.30 at Wesley and Christ Church is 9 o'clock. 9 o'clock. So both services, Good Friday and Sunday, Easter Sunday at Christ Church will be 9 o'clock and 7.30 at Wesley. Okay, we want to thank you so very much, but we will rise again. Just lift up your faith and put your minds to the task and shoulders to the wheel. Pray without ceasing and all will be well. Until next week at the same time, the same place. This is your host, Roosevelt Dave, reminding you to be good to yourself. Say a kind word to someone. Have a wonderful good day. Victor, pass, pass it on. on. Pass, pass it on. on. Pass it on. Um,